Okay. So this one is about uh, Ethernet in the 21st century. Um, quickly going through the agenda for this uh, presentation. Um, in a quick introduction of the speakers, uh, we'll describe the problem and uh, some background information on our uh, on the bridge in FreeBSD, STP, and MSTP, uh, the implementation of MSTP, and uh, some future work and questions. Um, so, as you many people know, Philip is uh, aware of many hats. Um, um, he was uh, uh, helpful, and, and we're glad to have him uh, help us uh, with, with this development on the bridge. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, navigate the meanders of, of, of the FreeBSD project is not an easy task, and he's been uh, really helpful with that. Um, <clears throat> I'm a physics engineer. I was working in a kernel, have been developing uh, network drivers and um, uh, transport protocol in FreeBSD for more than 15 years now, and uh, ended up a VP of engineering at Zipplink. Um, <clears throat> so what does Ziplink do and uh, what is Ziplink? We're a small company. We're based in Montreal. Um, we build and sell metal boxes that uh, are categorized as WAN optimizers. Um, we're specialized in optimizing stressed wireless link, uh, so high bit error rate link, high latency. Our key markets are the satellite industry, maritime system, aviation, uh, military and government. Um, <clears throat> speaking of government, in this particular case here in the picture, down, you can see it's one of uh, uh, an emergency system truck. So, you know, one of the 800 uh, tornado that hit America uh, every year, you know, wipes out the communication system. They deploy these uh, trucks with our solution in it. Uh, they boom out the um, uh, cellular access people then can back, we backhold the communication through uh, the satellite. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, in a project like this, um, obviously um, robustness uh, and redundancy is, is a key, because uh, that's, you know, the last system that you've got for your communication. So um, we've insert ourselves into the, uh, you know, as a middle box, we insert ourselves into the pad uh, as a bump in the wire and um, uh, we hook ourselves up in uh, redundancy in a matter where we're running um, CARP on two uh, Ziplink devices, we're running STP on each side uh, of each boxes, and in order to optimize properly the traffic, um, all forward packets and return packets must go through the same machine. Um, and so this is where uh, we run uh, watchdog programs that monitors the states of STP and monitors the states of CARP to make sure that um, the states of all these uh, protocols converge into getting the packets uh, continuously flowing through uh, the system. So now what happens, and this is great and it works fine, what happens when you add VLANs to the picture? Um, you know, that's a problem. It becomes a problem. And um, I think I'll pass the mic to uh, Philip to start explaining why it is and where it comes from. Thanks. All right, let's try not to drop the microphones. Um, so has anyone run Bridge on FreeBSD? Or has anyone not run Bridge on FreeBSD? That's easier. That should cover everyone, I think. Yes. So the uh, <laughs> right. So <laughs> the, uh, the conceptual model of the Bridge on FreeBSD is roughly like this. Uh, so many people think the, uh, the if bridge driver is a little bit like an Ethernet switch with you know any number of ports, but really what it is it's it's just an Ethernet splitter rather than a uh, rather than a switch. So I tried to find a photo of pieces of string glued together or twisted twisted pair twisted together because that's roughly the conceptual model of the bridge on FreeBSD. So when you um, when you do if config bridge zero creates you basically instantiate one of these pieces of plastic and uh, bridge zero add member add member add member just creates more of more splits out of the uh, piece of plastic so that's not uh, not a particularly uh, smart sort of model uh, the advantage of this 
it's, it's very easy to configure, and it's got pretty much zero overhead. You just keep adding uh, splits out of here, and your packets, you know, your packets go in on one side, and they come out on all the other sides, and, and everything is good, and it it just works. And the I think the the main use case of the FreeBSD bridge is people who uh, run wireless access points and have a router sitting on one end and then an access point sticking on another end and they want this to be a single broadcast domain and that works it works really great for that uh, but the drawbacks of this is that uh, there's a high potential for bridge loops so there's nothing preventing you from taking a cable and sticking it between there uh, or doing the moral equivalent of that by plugging one bridge into another bridge uh, either on the same system or on a system downlink. Uh, and there's also no opportunities for load balancing on the system. All the packets uh, that come into the bridge go out on all of the interfaces on, uh, of this same bridge. Uh, so that, that's good on a simple uh, home network, but in the real world that ZipLink works in, the network looks a little bit more like this. So I stole this diagram from the uh, .1Q IEEE standard for you know, Ethernet. And so this is much more like a real network. You've got, eight, uh, you've got eight switches, or eight bridges, as the standard calls them. And they've all got at least two connections to one other bridge. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, what happens here on Ethernet is that the packets going from, say, switch eight to switch uh, four, they can take uh, two paths to the switch. So they can go through L and then they can go through into here and then they follow that path and they end up into here and then they come back out into here. So you've got your packets going round and round in circles and if you, uh, if you do this you get a lot of packets on your network but not, uh, not a lot of gratification because all your, all your packets will just keep going round and round in circles and we call that a, uh, we call that a bridge loop and you don't want loops on an Ethernet network because bad things happen. You, you just have 100% have loads without any real traffic going through. Uh, so the point of the spanning tree protocol, it's a very old protocol, I'll describe it a bit uh, more detailed in a moment, is to look at all of your uh, switches and pick out one loop-free topology. Uh, so uh, this is the physical manifestation of the network. You've got two cables plugged into every switch and you've got a full mesh network and the active or one possible active topology through this network is this one so uh, there's still a cable here but no packets are going through it this is open here so packets from eight uh, to four can only take one path and it's through three and then to one and then down to four right does that make sense all right, so how does this spanning tree protocol work? Well, uh, it's very simple. It's uh, described in a little poem, uh, I think written in, I don't know, a long time ago. Um, so the spanning tree protocol describes a graph. Uh, so, you know, edges, edges and nodes. And uh, the, the point of this graph is to create loop-free connectivity. So packets can go to every node on the graph, but they can't go back to themselves. Uh, and the way this works is that you select uh, a route. How do you select it? Well, you select it by its ID, more on that in a moment. Uh, and then you pick the uh, least cost path uh, through the graph. So you look at all of your switches and you pick the path that's the cheapest. And by cheapest, we mean the one that's the fastest. Packets can go through this the fastest. If you've got one slow link and one fast link, uh, spanning tree will pick the fastest link. Uh, by preference. If all of your links uh, are equally fast, then spanning tree will pick the one with the lowest ID. So the lowest MAC address wins the race in that case. Uh, and then once uh, you figured out what's, which ports are the uh, least cost path, you've uh, you found yourself a spanning tree. Uh, and the uh, algorithm just keeps working all the time. So if you plug in uh, if this cable gets cut, well, actually, let's go into this one. If this cable gets cut, the uh, spanning tree algorithm automatically goes and uses this one and then figures out by itself what the new topology is. And the advantage of this algorithm is that no single bridge needs to know where all the other bridges are. The only thing it needs to know is its shortest path to whatever the root bridge is. 
Does that make sense? Does everyone know how spanning tree works? Any questions? No? Good. So, so that's, uh, that's easy enough. So uh, the original spanning tree protocol uh, propagated really slowly. So you turn out uh, a message to your neighboring bridge saying, hello, my, my, route, my path to the route is this port. And it would take about 10 seconds before you would start forwarding packets. And uh, this was very slow. And it got so slow that DHCP was cranky. And that earned the spanning tree protocol a reputation for it doesn't work nice with DHCP. And people turn spanning tree off on their networks because, oh no, it's slow. My ports will only forward after the HTTP has given up. So I better turn this off. And then you have bridge loops in your network, which is not great. Um, so very soon after the spanning tree uh, protocol was specified, uh, an upgrade was specified called the rapid spanning tree protocol. And everywhere you encounter spanning tree these days, it's basically rapid spanning tree. Uh, and the, the rapid spanning tree protocol is 100% compatible with the old spanning tree protocol to the point that it can uh, fall back automatically. It'll detect that uh, you're on a classic spanning tree bridge and it'll start speaking spanning tree uh, to that bridge. Uh, pretty much everyone supports RSTP. I don't think I've seen any device that just does plain STP in the last, I don't know, 15 years or so. Uh, and on FreeBSD, the default spanning tree protocol is RSTP. And if we detect that there's an STP on one of our links, we'll just speak classic spanning tree on uh, that port. So how does this protocol work? Well, it's very simple. Uh, <laughs> it's really a very simple protocol. Uh, you've got uh, every port has a couple of timers, uh, so per port. And every port has a role. It's either forwarding packets or it's waiting for another port to go down and become packets. That we call that a designated port. Uh, and you've got uh, some transitions in the spanning tree. And it's, it's not really difficult. But if you look at this diagram, I'm not going to go through the whole state machine because that'll drive everyone nuts. Uh, but if you look at the uh, little boxes, everything has a per port or uh, a per bridge uh, designation. So either uh, a state machine is operating on this port or it's operating on the whole bridge. And that's fairly easy to implement. Uh, the uh, FreeBSD implementation is all in one file. Uh, and to enable this uh, protocol, the good news is you don't need to know anything about the state machine if you're just using FreeBSD. All you need to do is you create a bridge, uh, you add your member interfaces, and then you turn on spanning tree on all of these interfaces. So you can say, OK, I want spanning tree on this member interface. But I know that this member interface is connected to something catastrophically stupid that doesn't support spanning tree. So I'll not enable it on this port. Uh, but usually, you want spanning tree enabled on all ports. And the only reason it's not on by default is that if config is a pain in the neck. Uh, but once you've done this, you've still your bridge still behaves exactly the same as it did before, except that it's going to be participating in the spanning tree protocol. Uh, spanning tree off after you turn it on? Yes. So uh, you if you want to turn it off, you do minus STP, which is, yes, so very intuitive. <laughs> um, if you want to have some control over uh, what your active topology looks like, you can fiddle with the priority. So remember when I said that the least path uh, cost is uh, defines which port is chosen. And by default, your, uh, your priority or your path cost is defined by uh, the speed of your link. If all your links are the same speeds, then the MAC address wins. Uh, if you want to just you know, have a little bit more control over which port is taken, you can say, OK, so this, this EM, EM0 has a path cost of 1, which means the expanding tree protocol, this is a 1 terabit per second link. Trust me, I know it's 10 megabits. But it's, for the purpose of a spanning tree, it's a terabit per second link, and it's a lot cheaper than the other one. So if you're, you know, if you're running spanning tree on a network where you pay for your packets, you might twiddle with this. Or if you know that one of your switches uh, needs to be replaced, you can, uh, you can prevent uh, some topology changes by forcing the path cost at a time that's convenient for you. So the FreeBSD bridge gives you a couple of opportunities to um, 
to set the topology. So that's all very nice, but what, what's wrong with it? Uh, as Karim said earlier, well, VLANs is what's wrong with it. Uh, the spanning tree protocol <coughs> operates only on pieces of string. It doesn't know anything about VLANs. So if you've got uh, an Ethernet with 500 VLANs uh, and uh, you, uh, you configure a spanning tree, then all your 500 VLANs are going to be on one of the pieces of string uh, defining the active topology throughout your network. Uh, that's not very really nice because it basically means 50% of your bandwidth is unused. You could put 250 VLANs on one link and 250 VLANs on the other link and there would still be a loop-free topology for each of these VLANs. So um, how, do we, how do we go about this? Well, uh, the, uh, the naive implementation is, well, let's just run spanning tree uh, on the VLANs. Let's uh, run on our bridge. Let's create a bridge interface, stick in VLAN 101, 102, VLAN 101, 102 on these different interfaces, and let's just run spanning tree over the uh, VLANs. That's not how it works. If you try this on FreeBSD, up to uh, here, things are going to work, I think. But as soon as you try to enable spanning tree, uh, the, the computer will say, nope, you can't do this, uh, because the spanning tree protocol uh, operates using uh, what's called BPDUs, bridge protocol data units, which cannot be VLAN tagged. So they, they must be sent from the interface itself. Also, if you've got uh, 1,000 VLANs, or you've got, in the, the personal case, you've got 4,096 VLANs, uh, then you will have 4,096 spanning tree instances and your CPU will be calculating the spanning tree all the time. And for many of these VLANs, the spanning tree will just be the same. So that's not the, um, that's not the, spanning, that's not the way we do spanning tree on multiple VLANs. Um, instead, what we have is we have a protocol called the MSTP, the Multiple Spanning Tree Protocol. Uh, which is an upgrade of RSTP. It is to RSTP as RSTP is to STP. Uh, and it's also 100% compatible with RSTP. So if you've got MSTP enabled on your bridge and you've got a switch or another bridge connected to it that does not support spanning tree or multiple spanning tree, it will fall back to RSTP and you won't even notice. Uh, if by some miracle, you have found a very old device that doesn't even do rapid spanning tree, it'll fall back all the way to spanning tree. Uh, if it doesn't even support spanning tree, well, then, you know, it's just Ethernet. Uh, spanning tree doesn't, uh, is no hard dependency. Uh, and the way this works is it builds a spanning tree of spanning tree. So you, I'll show a little diagram later, uh, but it's trees all the way down, and the multiple spanning tree basically builds a spanning tree of smaller spanning trees, which contain one or more VLANs. Uh, and just like RSTP, it operates largely autonomously. If you don't want to configure all of your path costs and all of your priorities, you don't have to, uh, because uh, the priorities are defined by default by the link speeds, and any ties are broken by the MAC address, exactly the same as uh, classical MSTP. So what's new in this protocol? We have uh, things called regions, and a region in the context of spanning tree is a collection of bridges that agree on uh, a name, and a name can be anything, you can call them Alfred, uh, but most people uh, use a slightly more uh, meaningful name, uh, and a revision. So the, uh, you, you can configure your regions and your spanning trees inside your regions independently, and as long as you keep your region number in sync, or your region name and your revision in sync, the topology will, will match and will form a little island of spanning tree, and then the little islands of spanning tree uh, are connected to each other with another spanning tree. So you've got the bridges within a region uh, will calculate their what they call the internal spanning tree or the, uh, the MSCI, multiple spanning tree instance. And then the root bridges of those little islands uh, will calculate the spanning tree between them. And that's called the common and internal spanning tree. Uh, and you then get, uh, at the end of the day, you have loop-free connectivity inside your little regions and packets stay in there and between the regions uh, which are also loop-free. Does that make sense? A little diagram is probably helpful. So you have uh, one region here. So this is uh, region C0, we call it, because C, uh, A, B, C, D, I went clockwise. Um, so this is one 
uh, spanning tree instance, one MSTI uh, running on these links, and these switches have decided that this is the root, this is one spanning tree, and this is connected to this little island, which only has one switch in it, but that's okay, you don't need more switches. This might actually just be a, uh, an ISCP network with nothing uh, particular on it. This is one with four switches, and they've decided that this one is the root, and that's three switches. Uh, and of all these islands, uh, each of these is morally equivalent to a single switch. For the purpose of uh, RSTP, or the, the common spanning tree, each of these is one switch, and they behave uh, just like rapid spanning tree, calculating the, the tree between them. Does that make sense? Everyone's lost, everyone's asleep, good. Excellent. Um, so um, this is another representation of the same uh, sort of uh, thing. You have the, uh, within the region, uh, or within the MSTP region, you've got uh, your, uh, and there's different names for the same things, right? So you have the, uh, the common and internal spanning tree is the, the black dashes that go between your root bridges, and then the MSTI, are your, uh, your, in, your multiple spanning tree instances that operates inside the bridge. But from the, uh, from the outside, each of these regions behaves just like a normal bridge. Um, I don't remember why this diagram is here. Uh, but this is uh, one of the uh, other attempts. Uh, I think you have patches that implement this. Um, so this is a, a more naive implementation which is compatible with MSTP, but it's not quite MSTP, where you will, uh, how did you do this, uh, Karim? You have so a... You kind of enslave each of the VLANs through the same right. region. And so you kind of turn off the STP, right. the MSTP on the VLANs themselves, but then they all get to carry without the tags. Right. The so, uh, so if you don't have MSTP, so this was a, a first attempt at an implementation, you turn off spanning uh, an STP on one of the interfaces, and then you build little islands like that. But that's right. So th all the VLANs are basically going to converge to the same tree. Right. So instead of sending VLAN tag, BTD. Right. So yeah, this is a slightly naive implementation. Uh, oh, that's the enslaving. Right. Um, and this is just uh, the. Yes, yet another, implement in, uh, let, yet another diagram, I'll come back to it in a moment because I'm going to, oh, I'm not going to run out of time, that's good. Um, so uh, let me talk about the implementation because that's a lot more interesting. Uh, and one day you two will be able to run it. Uh, so the good news is that most of the uh, spanning tree code is contained in two files. It's in bridgestp.c and bridgestp.h, which I think came to us from NetBSD originally. And they've mostly been left to to languish because the protocol is actually fairly simple. Um, and I have to do some modifications to the uh, bridge codes. And that's every time I look at the bridge codes, I find so many more interesting things to do, like you know, learn JavaScript or go and paint a house. Uh, and the biggest annoyance of this whole, whole implementation is if config, uh, because it now needs to do a lot more things. It needs to configure the bridge, it needs to uh, configure the spanning tree regions, I'll come to that in a moment, and then you need to get a lot of statistics out and the active topology and maybe the previous topology. So if config needs to uh, send a lot of data out through what's a very narrow uh, interface. Uh, so what I've done is I've taken the, uh, there's two structures in bridgestp.h which describe uh, what a spanning tree looks like and I've made them spanning tree a bit aware uh, and I'll show a little uh, diagram, I think, on one of my next slides, unless it's disappeared. Uh, many of the um, per port variables, which we saw in the earlier state diagram, have become per tree variables, and some have become per tree and per port. Uh, so this, the MSCP is really a tree of trees, so all of the little spanning tree variables just create an extra level of indirection, because that's how you solve every problem in computer science. You just add an extra level of indirection. Uh, so a lot of this code was just very mechanical. I created a you know, BridgeSDP instance with all of these variables. And where did I get those variables? Well, I pulled them out of the states. Uh, so all of these uh, things just went into a BridgeSDP instance. And the common and internal spanning tree is just one instance of the tree and behaves morally equivalently to um, 
to RSDP, and then oh, at the bottom of the screen here, there's uh, an array of spanning tree instances, and you create uh, an instance every time uh, you want to add an extra tree. Uh, so that was the easy bit, uh, and then uh, I went through and I mechanically uh, did this 400 times, so all of these per bridge variables now became uh, the common spanning tree variables, and each of these functions that works on these trees now got a pointer to either an instance or to the common tree. And it was all very mechanical and not very difficult. Um, the difficult bit was uh, if config. So if you, uh, if you look at all the information that needs to come out of if config, you need to have the, uh, so this was already there. This is the, the, the bridge ID and your priority and all that. Uh, but now it also needs to know the common uh, root. And then for each of these MSTIs, it needs to know the root of that tree. And if you've got 15 different instances, all 15 of them will be listed here. And then you've got your member interfaces. That was already there. And well, there's clearly a bug here uh, because they're both discarding. Uh, but one of them is actually forwarding for some VLANs. So that's still uh, work in progress. Um, but uh, yeah, so if you want to create a multiple spanning tree, uh, I've kept most of the uh, syntax the same. So you go and create uh, a bridge and you set the protocol to MSTP. Uh, one day I think that should be the default, but we'll get to that at some point. You add your member interfaces and then you set spanning tree on. Uh, currently there's no real way to force uh, RSTP on a link, uh, but I might add that at some point. You set the uh, region name and you set the, uh, the revision. And now you are, uh, you are one of these guys. Once you've done that, you become, uh, if I have my diagram. Uh, hello. Where's my diagram gone? Uh, yes. So now you are a region. You've set your region name to something and you've set your revision to whatever. And both of them need to be the same uh, for you to form an MSDP island. Can I just jump to a slide in this program? Uh, should be able to, like that. Um, uh, and then, so to create a region, you need to have some VLANs in this region. So a region is a collection of VLANs. So you create an MSTI. Uh, MSTI 1 will have VLANs 100 to 103. And MSCI 2 will have the VLANs 200 to 203. So now you have, um, you have two spanning trees uh, with VLANs in them. And you've got three spanning trees in total. So you've got the common tree that's the topology between your bridges. And then you've got the two little subtrees that have their own spanning tree within their region. But the protocol is the same uh, for all of them. Uh, and uh, the advantage of uh, this configuration is that now uh, your VLAN 100 to 103 will go along one piece of string, and your VLAN 200 to 203 will take another piece of string, and uh, your network uh, will use its available bandwidth a lot more uh, effectively. Uh, you, can set the, uh, you can set the priorities uh, per uh, instance as well. Uh, so if you want to be the root bridge for a certain set of VLANs, you can set your priority lower, and then you will pro well, if you set it to zero, you're very likely to be the root bridge. If you set your priority to something very high, you're very unlikely to be the root bridge. And that way you can manage your topology and your load balancing inside your network. So um, yeah, uh, future work. Well, one of these days I should commit it uh, to head. Hmm? Uh, that I've set the region after I've enabled spanning tree. You yeah, know, I mean, you're adding members. Yes. But then you have some seconds until you're able right. to clean if that's uh, like two seconds on a 10 bit link. Yes, then. then yes, at this point you're already, at this point you're already uh, flooding the link with packets. Yeah. Uh, but actually, uh, the bridge uh, starts by being down, I think. Uh, I don't think if you create a bridge. It will be down when you create it. Well, 
Yes, you can do that as well. Yeah, so you can do Adam, Adam, SCP, SCP on one line. That's, uh, that's not a problem. Uh, but yeah, so it's mostly for formatting uh, because it's a, good, it's a good point. At this point, if the bridge is up, you've got a loop and with any luck, you're not connected over SSH because if you're on SSH, this could be yes. <laughs> this could be the last command you type until the machine and all its friends. Uh, well, all its friends will not give up because the uh, the loop will be detected by the next bridge over, and it will cut one of the links. Within and actually, the longest it will take is one hello time, yeah. right? So the longest it will take is ten seconds, and one of the links will be uh, discarding. Um, and uh, I think. Currently, you can't set the region in, uh, at the same time as the uh, enabling spanning tree because this parsing, this mess is, uh, is if config. Uh, someone was going to librarify if config. Has that happened yet? <laughs> Has it? Has it? Um, so, and then, yeah, so adding, uh, adding VLANs, I would like to also make that uh, a range because if you've got 4,000 VLANs, typing them all, by hand is, is not going to be a pleasant uh, sort of experience. Actually got code for that. Hmm? You, have, you have code for that, excellent. Uh, that means I don't have to write it. Uh, so yes, so my, uh, my, my goal is to definitely have this in FreeBSD 12. Uh, there's a mostly, uh, almost mostly working prototype on, uh, on GitHub. If you look for my name, you will uh, find it in the MSTP branch. Uh, it does have quite a few deadlocks uh, in it because the, uh, the, the if bridge code has a lot of very interesting locking scenarios and I uncover them uh, by having many more state transitions than I had with regular spanning tree because you have this tree of trees and your VLANs all just need to go into there and it, it turns into a big mess. So I'm, uh, I need to give some more love to, uh, to IfBridge, but I will have it into FreeBSD 12, which will be released, I think, uh, I don't remember, early next year, so it should be in a tree before it, uh, it freezes. Uh, it'll definitely be possible to merge it to 11 stable because that's what I've been doing my work on, and Karim wants me to merge it as far back as nine, so that should, uh, should not be a big problem. Uh, the good news is that ZipLink uh, is more than happy to help me with uh, codes and infrastructure to test this, uh, but more testing will always be uh, helpful. Uh, and uh, yeah, I noticed this last bullet point, uh, shortest path bridging. So MSDP, by the time it's in uh, FreeBSD, will already be obsolete. Uh, the current, uh, what the cool kids are doing these days in Ethernet is something called shortest path bridging, which I think is the, uh, the sick love child of Ethernet and ISIS. So anyone who wants to go and implement that, uh, you know, please, please go ahead and do it because I'm reluctant to, uh, to go down that road. Any questions, comments? Please don't ask me when is it going to be committed. <laughs> committed now? Yes, no. <laughs> Any other questions? Does anyone use MSTP on other networks with Juniper things or things? If this was ready, I would deploy it this weekend. Well, OK. Uh, <laughs> cool. So you're running MSTP on Cisco things, or you want to? Yes. So you're, OK, so you're wasting half your bandwidth, and you want to stop wasting it. I want switch redundant. Well, I want layer 1 redundancy. Right. VLANs doesn't make me hurt. Right. Yeah. Well, it's still going to hurt, because it's still Ethernet. But. Uh, <laughs> Right, yeah. So the, yeah, it's still, I, I think the, uh, the user interface uh, can definitely be better. Uh, so I, I really don't like this, uh, this sort of mess, but I, I stole that from Cisco. So they have this, well, Cisco has a way of, uh, and I'm tempted to do that because, uh, Philip, you mentioned this, you have these race conditions. Um, Cisco works around the race conditions by having you describe your topology and then committing your topology, and it's not, you know, you type it and then that's the last command you type. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, unfortunately, if, you know, if config does not make this sort of thing easy, uh, if config is very much a, uh, a very thin user space wrapper around uh, IOCATL. <laughs> so, you know, every, every command you type just goes into the kernel and you, you hope for the best. So I'd have to, uh, I'd have to re-architect if config quite a bit. But hopefully someone else will do that for me. Or make it so you can send more than one command in one 
Yeah, well, there are ways to, to work around this, but it's, it's yeah, uh, the, the locking in the bridge is already nasty enough to, uh, to, to drive you to distraction. Any other questions? Comments? <laughs> you want this? Okay, well, you'll get it, honest. <laughs> I promise it'll be there. Uh, yeah, uh, feel free to uh, go and poke around at my bench on GitHub if you like. Uh, if it deadlocks, you get to keep all the spinning locks. Uh, but I'll fix the, uh, I'm, I'm definitely working on finishing this so it can go into uh, heads really soon. It's been tested on three switches. <laughs> so, but spanning tree, the multiple spanning tree is definitely usable. Uh, and uh, in theory, uh, so the, the, the way the protocol works is it's, uh, it's constant time. There's no, uh, it doesn't scale with the number of switches you have because every switch only needs to know about its roots. So the, um, the performance is limited by the number of instances you have and on any reasonable CPU you will be able to run as many instances as you like. And you're limited, I think, to 60 instances anyway. And the FreeBSD machine will have no problem running 60 instances, whereas a Cisco switch might barf. It's all in kernel? Uh, it's all in the kernel, yes. So. There's a, there's a Linux user space implementation, which I, yeah, I encourage you to look at it if you feel that you're not sad enough. <laughs> yes, yeah, pretty much. So it's, it's a really, it's a fairly lightweight protocol. And the only thing the mul multiple spanning tree does is it creates an extra layer of indirection. So instead of calculating one tree on your bridge, you're going to calculate up to 60, 63, I think, uh, trees. And, and it's still, it's just a couple of pointers. Uh, so the weight of your infrastructure will definitely take you down before. Um, so yeah, so some of the uh, some of the uh, bridge locking bugs uh, make testing annoying uh, because the uh, I would love to be able to run a v, a v image jail with a couple of bridges in them connected to other bridges in other jails, but if you try that, then you very quickly uh, make the machine sad. Um, but Christoph is going to fix all of that. <laughs> yes, no. Uh, any other questions? No? In that case, I think lunch. <laughs>